Thank you. Um, and let me just, uh, as, as we uh, like to introduce Carter and introduce myself a bit and the Institute for Health Metrics. As I mentioned, I'm Chief Medical Officer and co-founder of the Institute for Health Metrics. We're a not-for-profit hospital data collaborative, and we've been around for over 10 years working with community hospitals around the country on uh, information-based innovation. And one of the reasons that we're excited about synthetic data, although there are many reasons to be excited about it, but one of the reasons is the enhanced de-identification um, involved with synthetic data technology and the data sets it creates. And Carter is obviously going to speak to that in more detail. Data sets um, can then be more easily used in research or for modeling, just to name a couple of use cases. So with that being said, I'd like to turn you over to my colleague, Carter Prince from Sintegra, who in the next uh, 25 minutes or so is going to make you an expert in Sintegra. <laughs> Carter. It's Thanks, your Anita. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you all for joining us today. And like Anita said, I will uh, I will do my best to give you the the, the basics, but you know, I'll, I'll I'm sure we'll mention at the end. But you know, please reach out to us as you'd like to learn more, and we can always go deeper in the future together. But um, you know, some of the things I'll touch through quickly today are what is synthetic data, um, how we Syntegra, uh, in working with IHM, uh, work to generate that synthetic data. What is our approach? How do we actually validate what good looks like? So both in terms of fidelity as well as privacy of the data. Um, and, and then what are some of those applications in general? And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. So, you know, at a starting point, really, what is synthetic data? This may be a term some of you have heard, uh, maybe in many different contexts. It's definitely a term at this moment that can mean a lot of different things depending on the context folks are using it. But in this case, when we say synthetic data, what we mean is realistic but not real data that is trained on a real data source such as the IHM aggregated data maintaining all of the statistical features of that data set at a patient level but not actually containing any real patient records and so like Anita mentioned earlier this really lets you start using data without the privacy risk that is associated, you know, even with the identified data sources, you know, going as far as cases like GDPR not being subject to this data whatsoever. Uh, and really, what does that enable? It enables you to take a very data centric approach to research, innovation, modeling, et cetera. Now, this is by no means uh, exhaustive, but some of the areas where we're seeing organizations use synthetic data today are, are research. Uh, for example, at health systems where they want to do a more rapid uh, research project without even having to do an IRB, because again, you're not working with real patient data, uh, using this for software modeling, uh, as well as software development and testing. You know, cases where oftentimes having data that you give to a development team um, is not the same, you know, kind of production quality of the real data because of privacy concerns. How can this help overcome that? As well as then, you know, in the predictive realm, this is a really interesting area for synthetic data uh, due to some of the generative capabilities that I'll talk about as we go, where you can go beyond the identification. Now, Syntegra's approach is uh, very unique in this space. Uh, we use something called a transformer-based language model. Uh, and if anyone wants to look up more information on that, I recommend you Google GPT-3. That is one of the most common. Uh, it's similar in structure to what we're using, although Syntegra does have our own proprietary model. And basically what those approaches do oh, is learn the underlying distribution and all the patterns of the real data. Uh, you know, all of the format, the rare cohorts, the interrelated elements of the data itself to generate actual new patient records. And so, like I mentioned, you know, we're using this thing called GPT-3. Uh, essentially this comes from uh, more language spaces such as generating new text. For example, you can feed these models uh, Hamlet, Othello, Julius Caesar, other works of Julius, uh, of um, William Shakespeare, and then generate brand new Shakespeare, um, where basically the model learns how do the words within this work uh, connect with each other and using those patterns, those connections to predict what's to come next. And that's really why we took this approach to generate synthetic data, because for healthcare, 
because the fact of every single word in a sentence predicting what comes next works really well when you think about healthcare, where everything that's happened to a patient up into a point in time directly impacts what's to come next. And so this approach works really well. And so essentially the way this works is we take the underlying data, uh, which you know may be in many relational tables, such as persons or demographics, conditions, procedures, labs, drugs, et cetera, and we stretch that longitudinally on a patient by patient basis. Now this lets us think of this now as a patient sentence, which fits within the construct of these language models. And essentially the model is looking to learn what is the higher level distribution that those real patient records are sampled from, right? At a statistical level. And once it's learned that, that's what we call the Syntegra medical mind. And once those patterns are learned, we can start essentially sampling or generating down entirely new synthetic patient records. And now this is very simplified, but conceptually the way that works is you may generate a 46 year old man. And then the model looks to say, well, what's the likely next variable? I show three outcomes here. In reality, you would have hundreds or hundreds of thousands of potential outcomes, but there's essentially a probability distribution based on what's come before. The model selects down within that and then continues to go until you've built an entire patient record. What's really important to remember here though, is that every variable, event, outcome, whatever you want to think of it as, that appears is conditioned on every single thing that came before it. And that's really where you're able to start maintaining not just simple distribution accuracy, you know, how many uh, patients are there that are 50 years old or between 50 and 60 or have, you know, broader categories of disease, but actually maintain the complicated correlations and even multivariate relationships that exist in the real data. Now, to show you that at a conceptual level, I'm going to step out for a second and show you a visualization tool. So what you're looking at here is a three dimensional representation of a real patient data set. This happens to be a federally available cancer data set called SEER, where every single dot is a patient record. Uh, and we're using a technique called UMAP that lets us show this multivariate data set in three dimensions. And it does a really good job of retaining the relationships between the data points, so essentially the clustering of similar types of patients. And so you can see this data looks like you might expect from a patient data set, right? Where you've got large clusters of similar patients, um, kind of a middle 80%, if you will. But then you also have all of these outliers or rare cohorts around the edges of the screen. Now, like I said, we learn the kind of distribution of this data and the uh, interconnected patterns within and generate a synthetic data set, again, at a patient level, and then show this, it's helpful to see the two together, you can see that the synthetic data replicates the real data incredibly well, not just at the kind of central tendency or that middle 80%, if you will, but most excitingly at all of these edge cases, if I look around the screen, both some of these smaller or rare cohorts, as well as true kind of very small outcomes. And that's really important when you're talking about using this data to derive new insights, given those rare outcomes are often your kind of point of interest or you know what is the outcome of interest you're looking to study. Now this three-dimensional representation also kind of helps you show uh, some of the privacy elements I mentioned and kind of that concept of how you're sampling from a distribution. So you can see here the real patients which are the purple dots as well as the uh, synthetic patients which are the green dots and they're right next to each other in this physical space but they're not 100% on top of each other. And that's actually really important because if they're right on top of each other, great, we've created absolutely perfect fidelity, but no privacy whatsoever. And so it's actually really important to show, yes, these are a sampling from the same distribution, but they are new patients. And now when I show this, this is a really helpful tool to look at things at a conceptual level and see it at a uh, kind of representation, but it isn't how we actually define what does good look like. Uh, it also is not the format of the data I should call out. You know, when we're generating synthetic data here, the resulting format is the same as the real. So for those of you who have, you know, worked with the IHM data, the resulting synthetic form of that data from a format standpoint looks exactly the same. But to show you how we actually do do validation in a little more detail, I want to show you an example of a, a recent project we at Syntegra did with a large academic medical center up in the Northeast. Um, and so now this data uh, was not the exact same format as the IHM data, but very similar in that it's the OMOP format, which is a uh, frequently used common data model, but again, has a full longitudinal structure, just like IHM's data. 
Now, this was a relatively large data set, a little over a million patients, which for this hospital represented their entire clinical data warehouse. It also had very dense clinical data with patients with many visits, uh, you know, long stinks of stay. But basically, this is a good representation of EHR data in general. And now, as we generate it down, uh, we start at looking at looking at univariate distributions for fidelity uh, kind of matching. And so that's what I show here, where the, the lighter blue uh, is, is the real data and the greenish color is the synthetic data. And, you know, this is relatively uninteresting to look at first other than saying, well, yeah, you know, it matches pretty well. But there's a couple of interesting things that you can look at in the examples we show here. And again, these are just some selected examples. So if we look at gender, uh, you can see on the left hand side here, this is actually a log scale. You know, again, it was over a million patients. Therefore, you're going to have many, many results in the, uh, the different genders. What's interesting is you can look that in the real data, 86 times there was this recorded gender of three. Uh, you know, unsure if this was a, you know, meaningful event, just very rare, if this is a common error in recording. The why doesn't really matter as much for what we're showing here, as much as to say even this very rare event, which is a fraction of a percent when you look at the overall size of the data set, is actually captured and represented very well when we generated down the synthetic data. Now, again, you're not going to have the exact same number because you're sampling from a distribution. You're not copying the data by any means. But it does show capturing that, uh, which is really important when you think about other rare cases, such as maybe a biomarker. Um, or a certain rare disease or other kind of cohorts that may be interesting, but have a very small sampling within the real data. The next level down, though, is looking at, like I mentioned, going beyond those univariate distributions and actually looking at correlations within the data. And are those maintained? And so here we look at pairwise correlations, the top 25 features in the data set. Uh, and on the left here, you see the correlations in the real data. And so, you know, we're not trying to derive any special insights from this other than to show, yes, this is what's there, right? You know, we're not, we're not creating anything new. These are the correlations that exist in the real data. And you kind of kind of see this on this heat map. What becomes exciting, though, is when you then look at what are those same correlations in the synthetic data? And obviously, this is a little bit less exact than looking at the previous slide. But if you start to pick out so many of those points of interest and kind of match across the two, you can see that the synthetic data um, replicates and maintains those correlations at the pairwise level incredibly well. The last thing, though, that we like to do is pull that forward all the way to what about those multivariate relationships, like I mentioned earlier on. Um, and a good way of looking at this is actually predictive modeling, given approaches such as gradient boosted trees really are looking at those multivariate relationships. And so in this case, we actually will train a predictive model or multiple. I'm just showing one. Um, testing one, training one model on the real data, in this case to predict mortality, at reserving 20% of that real data for testing, and then training another model only, or the same model, uh, only on the synthetic data, uh, testing both of them against the real. And as you can see, the performance of the model trained solely on the synthetic data is statistically the same as the model trained on the real data. You know, the looking at the lines, here, it's almost impossible to tell the difference. You really have to look down here at the area under the curve and you can see, you know, that the difference is fractional at best. And so really that gets very exciting in terms of asking, well, how can I use this data? And we talked about predictive cases, which this shows very clearly, but also for more traditional research, this shows that the relationships in the data that you are trying to study are maintained in the synthetic data source. The last one I want to show here, just because this is, you know, an, again, a type of uh, interesting analysis that folks will often do on the real data, is looking at things like treatment pathways. So in this case, we were looking at uh, hypertension and drugs that were given first line, second line. And, you know, again, the, the patient population, when you look just at these hypertension drugs, is not super large. It was only about 5,000 in the real data, a little over 5,000 in the synthetic data of what we generated. And so you're going to see some small difference at this, you know, small sample size. But it's really interesting to look that the, uh, the general kind of steps are maintained incredibly well, you know, both in terms of what the kind of breakdown of those first line drugs are. And then it's, you know, much harder to read here, but, you know, happy to follow up and show folks in more detail as well. But you can see that kind of the progression is maintained as well. So some of that longitudinal progression over time, in this case, in respect to drug use. So those are showing some of the uh, kind of the factors that the metrics we have in terms of how do you prove accuracy, how do you prove, do you prove fidelity. Um, and again, we have a white paper that 
if anyone's interested, please reach out. Happy to share that in more detail. Uh, it goes into 40 pages of detail on all of that if you're interested. But the second question is, how do you actually know it's private? And as I explained early on, conceptually, that privacy should be full. Uh, you know, given you are not actually taking a real patient record and doing something to it, like stripping out certain fields like you do in de-identification to create a private version or de-identified version of that data. Instead, you're actually breaking that link where you're just learning statistics and then creating new patients from those statistics. However, should be is not really good enough in healthcare. Uh, and so we've actually taken the step of defining that. How do you define, for example, that you haven't just copied those patient records? How do you define that if I am an attacker and I have a, um, an attribute of a real patient, or I even know a certain member of the data set, a real, uh, a real patient within the data set that was used to train the synthetic data, can I work backwards? And so those are exactly what we've developed these metrics, membership inference, attribute inference, and distance to closest record to go into more detail on. Um, again, these are in more detail on our white paper, happy to share that if of interest. But I would like to call out that an interesting thing we've done is we've actually partnered with a third party de-identification expert, uh, in this case, Mirador Analytics, um, to provide a third party certification of those metrics, which is the first time anyone has ever done that with synthetic data. So again, going beyond, hey, this data should be fully private and should be something you can really trust because it's not real patient data, to, hey, we have verified this with a third party. So very important to us to provide that kind of burden of proof. But like I mentioned, uh, you know, kind of moving beyond uh, de-identification is where things, in my opinion at least, get really interesting. So, you know, the baseline is, hey, how is this a form of de-identification essentially that goes beyond uh, even statistical determination or, you know, expert determination to provide a high level of privacy, a high level of comfort that you're not going to expose patient records. But once you go beyond that, that's where our generative capabilities really allow you to start to augment the data and take a very data-centric approach to exploration and innovation. Some of those areas are uh, expanding and normalizing the data, um, which I'll show in, in another second. Uh, scenario planning, for example, looking at how different risk outcomes may impact your population, or imputing missingness as well, which I won't show an example of here, but we can talk about more in Q&A, but essentially using that generative approach from earlier, if you think about the 46-year-old man, what's the next variable, what's the next variable, to allow the model to find instances where you find a missing or null value and essentially sample again to kind of elegantly impute that missingness. But to jump into more detail on that expansion and normalization case, uh, I'll show this here. So especially when you're working in the predictive world, uh, you know, it's very, it's become a very common focus just looking at this concept of algorithmic fairness. You know, how is potential lack of representation or misrepresentation in the underlying data creating different impacts in the results of those analysis, either predictions that are uh, inaccurate, predictions that are biased in certain directions. You know, this has become a big area of study. And so synthetic data and our generative approach actually allows you to start one, correcting for some of this bias, but also explore and understand that bias in more detail. So at the base level, think of a, a population that maybe has an overrepresentation of men, you know, which I think is, is common, for example, in clinical trials. When you generate down that population, we can do what's called conditional generation, basically generating with certain conditions to normalize that population. Kind of think at a most basic level, maybe we're saying, hey, generate a population that is now 50% men and 50% women. Uh, so, you know, create a more balanced data set that you can use for your model training. Going further though, those conditions can look at the extremes as well or any striation in between. So for example, let me actually generate a data set that is all men or a data set that is all women and feed that through my same models. And now that starts to give you directional indication of what are the impacts of that bias. So you know, when my model is trained only on men, how do certain uh, results skew compared to kind of my base model? Well, that starts to give me a good indication that because I have too many men in my underlying training data, that might mean that those same areas are getting skewed in my initial results. So again, just giving you a kind of data centric way to explore some of these results. And obviously I use the example of gender here, but that could be age, standard of care, other social determinants of health, you know, really whatever those variables may be that you wanna explore. Similarly, this ability to kind of generate different scenarios can be helpful for things such as risk scenario modeling. 
where maybe there's a value-based contract that an organization is entering into, for example, a hospital with a payer. And now today you may put your actual data uh, through a uh, through a model to kind of see, you know, what are the results going to be for my population? Um, and that works well for, you know, your population today, but obviously, you know, populations of patients are not static over time. You know, what is to happen if uh, on average your patients in your hospital are five years older, or maybe you're looking at merging or acquiring a nearby health system that's going to change your demographics. Those can all change the results of those models. So with the synthetic data, we can generate down again conditionally some of those vari variations on the core data set. So for example, let's generate a data set that do does have an average age of five years more than your core data, or generate down a data set where the demographics are slightly shifted to represent that hospital acquisition or hospital merger that's going to happen, or really any other scenario that would wanna be tested and putting that through the same model. Again, the idea being here, taking a data centric approach to that exploration. And so with that, I think, you know, I've given you a ton very quickly. So uh, you know, apologies for that. But those are some of the basics on what is synthetic data and, you know, why is it important and what does it allow in terms of some of the baseline of de-identification while maintaining accuracy, but then showing a little bit about where it goes beyond the real data as well. So with that, though, uh, you know, I know we'd love to open to Q&A, so Anita, I'll toss it back to you. Great. Carter, thank you. It's, uh, it's terrific. It's terrific. Uh, if you uh, could go to the last slide so that has our contact info up if uh, anybody wants to reach us about a question. But I've had a couple questions come through. So let me, we don't have a ton of time, but let me ask a couple of, of to you. Um, can you speak a little bit more about uh, predictive modeling mm -hmm. and synthetic data? How is that being used, um, you know, in kind of in the um, in the healthcare space. Yeah, so predictive modeling is what we think is is one of the most exciting areas for synthetic data for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being access to the right data quickly, and the second being some of those uh, expansion or augmentation abilities. So I'll start with the first quickly. On the access standpoint, um, machine learning modeling or predictive modeling does not fit very well with kind of the traditional paths of access to data in healthcare with IRBs and, you know, kind of other paths of, hey, I need to rightfully so control access to real patient data. You know, generally the approach is you can have the data that is the minimum viable product, essentially the minimum fields for what you need to explore. Uh, and that's something we see when we work, for example, directly with health systems. Now, predictive modeling, uh, especially with more modern approaches, uh, on the other hand, the whole idea is to work with as much data as possible and essentially explore and start to find some of those uh, patterns or indications that you didn't know about going in. And so those two things are kind of diametrically opposed from a process standpoint. And so that's an area where creating synthetic data that folks can safely, um, but still accurately, really do that exploration and find what patterns arise becomes really exciting. Uh, and you know, that's where as so a physician, for example, that may have an interest in machine learning and finding patterns for your patient population, you can quickly explore, hypothesize, test in the synthetic data, and then eventually take those insights to the real data. Because obviously, you know, our recommendation before you put anything into clinical care, it should be tested on the real data. But this gives you a whole uh, leg up, essentially, in the cycles up into that point. Um, so that's the most exciting area. You know, the other, just to touch on quickly, like I mentioned, that ability to expand rare cohorts or do that algorithmic fairness kind of normalization, those obviously become very important as well, especially if you're looking for an outcome of interest, which is very rare. Um, you could build a predictive model that is 99% effective, but if your outcome of interest only happens one time, you may have a totally worthless model. It never, never finds that outcome of interest. And by expanding that outcome of interest, that creates a more powerful way to allow those predictive models to actually be accurate and to actually work. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, how do you um, talk a little bit more about imputing missingness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so for that, um, I actually will slide back on slides real quick and show everyone this here. So if you think about this simplistic example where I showed, you know, sampling down and at each step I have a distribution. Yep. When we look at a data set, missingness, 
uh, really just becomes another value, right? And so I show chest pain, seizure, motor vehicle accident here. The next thing on the vet list could be null. Um, and you know that's the way we basically code it in, if you will, when we when we look at these data sets. And so what you can tell the model is for certain fields, again, not as a blanket statement, because some missingness is important, right? It's a, a feature, not a bug. Um, but in certain cases where appropriate, you can tell the model, don't allow missingness. And so, you know, at the most basic level, the way you can think about that is maybe the model looks to select here. The option it was going to select was no. You're basically telling the model, nope, try again. And so it selects again. Again, though, the value that gets put in instead is still based on that overall distribution and still based on everything that has come in that patient's record. And so it actually becomes a very elegant way of putting in a value that is appropriate for that patient being generated um, rather than a, you know, kind of simple guess or a placeholder or something along those lines. Great. Thank you. The, um, that was uh, very, very um, helpful in terms of the answers to those questions that came through, Carter. And also, I think you covered a tremendous amount in a short period of time. And I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I'd encourage people to look at the white paper because it's, um, uh, I'll say that there, there's a lot in there. Um, it's not something you're going to read in 30 seconds, but it's, <laughs> it's worth the read if you're interested in synthetic data. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I will say one more thing before we end, which is don't try to rewrite Shakespeare, though. <laughs> it doesn't go well. So, but I want to say thank you. And I want to say thank you to everybody who joined us today for this session. And uh, look forward to seeing you again for uh, another session in the future. And uh, hope that you all have uh, enjoyable and uh, healthy holidays. Thank you, Nita. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>